That's right. Don't get triggered. Timmy Andrews' podcast. My name's Phil, I'm the host and creator of the podcast, and as always, I'd like to welcome you to another episode. We are at episode 49. I am three episodes away from having done this for an entire year. Um, something, something, times flies, something, something, proverbial, something or other. Um, let's get into it. Another episode, another topic, another word of the day. Today's episode, brought to you by the tarot deck in front of me, is Passion. We're going to jump straight into this one. Um, We'll go over the cards. I'll work you through my mentality of how I got here. But I think this is a really, really good topic because I think it touches on a couple different specific points. And I also think you might be surprised about what the definition of passion actually is. I think we use the word passion. um, Remember, I take connotation out of everything, but we use passion almost in a connotation of like, oh yeah, like you have passion for something. When really the old English dictionary uh, definitions for it are more so on a negative connotation. Um, Passions are something to be wary of, if you will. So we'll jump into uh, Merriam-Webster's dictionary in a second. First, we're going to go through how I got here. Uh, Once again, if you're new to the podcast or if you're, you know, coming in in these last few episodes, I had started this podcast out trying to figure out uh, what self-awareness was, what, you know, what mental health is all about, what depression is and how, you know, we can define these things better, a vernacular we can start to use to open up the conversations, get rid of the connotation, you know, that it's all negative and terrible and spiraling out of control and we'll never understand. And then from there, I found that there's this missing link with the things we talk about regularly and the things we do in our lives with something known as spirituality. And I've talked about how spirituality has been coerced. I believe it to have been kind of fuddled with a little bit of a, a little bit of a, I don't know, a narcissistic approach to what this thing known as spirituality is. And there's so many different takes on it that it is becoming similar to depression. How depression is uniquely who you are, it's uniquely who I am, it's uniquely who everyone is, and we can't understand each other's depressions, but we can try, and that's a a really important thing for society and civilization and, and interactions and having relationships, and when I started delving into spirituality, I came across this idea that just like we have the physical human form, we have the mental health body as well. We have this third health body, the spiritual health body. And what might be pieces of that that we don't, you know, we don't often engage with or we overlook? And they can be our, what's known as our spiritual senses. So I started talking about intuition and instinct and insight. And then I got into imagination. And those were episodes 37 through 40. And then eventually I came across this idea of, you know what? Part of spirituality has to do with this other or this thing that we use what's known as the divinatory processes or to divine something. And so I started getting out the tarot deck and I started pulling cards and seeing what the tarot deck told me and my interpretation of the cards being pulled to what the topics I should be talking about. And this time around, I pulled four cards. Uh, I typically start with uh, one card. Um, I use a shuffle method of if a card pops out, I take that as a card that, you know, so I'm not like just pulling cards out of the deck. I'm shuffling the deck and a card might pop out of the deck as I'm shuffling it. And I go with that card as being one of the things that should guide me into what to talk about. And in this particular shuffling situation, uh, it didn't take long. Sometimes it takes a bunch of shuffles for me to get three cards. This one, all three cards came out within the second round of shuffling. All, and they all came out in the same round of shuffling. So I shuffled once, nothing happened, shuffled again, and three cards popped out. And then I decided to get another clarif- clarifying card, and that one actually came out in the second shuffle in that round. So not holding back here, let's get into it. The first card that came out was the Emperor card. Now, Emperor card, Major Arcana, so big, important idea. The Emperor represents... Um, I don't want to say abundance. The emperor represents what comes after the harvest, if you will. Uh, So in the major arcana, the empress teaches the fool about, you know, sowing the seeds, you know, building up stock and and stores and, you know, preparing and, and, you know, uh, building our homes and building community and building relationships and those types of things. The emperor is 
what you do once all those things happen. Like the empress builds the civilization. The emperor helps run the civilization. So once you have the harvest, how do you allocate it? Once you have the wealth and the income, what do you do with it? You know, what are the things you spend these uh, things on? What do you, what are the things you, um, you know, where the empress will say like, okay, you know, we all need to come together as community and build farms and, and build mills and, and build, you know, those types of things. The, the emperor really focuses on what do you, how do you manage that infrastructure? So the emperors build the infrastructure and the emperor manages the infrastructure. That's kind of how it's set up in the major arcana. These are the lessons. The major arcana is all about the lessons. The fool is being taught along the way. So the empress teaches about how to build, um, build your wealth, build your society, build your community, build yourself. You know, what, what stable foundation do you need to build to work from the emperor is, you know, what do you do when all that's kind of put in place and how do you allocate it and how do you manage it? So the first card is the emperor card. The second card was the nine of cups and the nine of cups is kind of a representation of, um, in some decks it's known as the wish card. It's uh, or that was the original idea that the nine of cups was the wish card. Now, modern day kind of readings specifically in the book I have, which I should mention is the mystical manga, um, tarot deck by Ran and the Texas by Barbara Moore. Uh, I keep forgetting to mention that, but that's what I use. I believe you can find it on Amazon. I'll throw a link on the archive at teaming Um, the nine of cups used to be referred to as the wish card and you know, modern society, do we really believe in wishes? Uh, probably not. So it's more of a representation of a middle ground between the wish card and, and the harvest. Uh, you know, what do you do after all the efforts put in? This is kind of that middle ground of like, okay, you, you, you put in the effort, you put in the time, you put in the dedication, good things could come from that. You know, fruition could come from that, you know, amazing things could bloom here. That being said, you know, you still have to kind of have had done that. You have to have made the good choices. You know, you reap what you sow almost, but it's possibility that you reaped the right things. You made the right decisions. After that came the 10 of coins and the 10 of coins is kind of, um, it's kind of a representation of what the ace of coins stands for. And this is like, yeah, there's abundance. There is wealth. There is plenty of grain for everybody. There is, you know, there is all of this stuff, but there's more than that. There's a, a fulfillment. There is a, a spiritual aspect, if you will, a, a point of, yeah, we've done all this. We've built community. Or maybe if you're thinking about yourself, this would be like, yeah, I went and I did this and I, I put in the time and I put in the effort and I built this wealth or this savings. And more so than just this monetary idea or more so of just this, this, um, uh, physical idea, or uh, I'm lacking the word I'm looking for here as per usual in these cases. Um, there's, there's more than just that. There's more than just the physical or, you know, material. There we go. There's more than just the materialistic or the, or the monetary. There's a fulfillment, a spiritual fulfillment, like a, a feeling of like, yeah, I awesome. I did like, this makes me feel good that I did that. So that's kind of what the 10 of um, coins represents. And then once I had those three out and I read, you know, I read over them, I kind of get used to them. I put together this idea of what these cards are telling me isn't really telling me anything. It's asking me something. These cards are like a question together to me. These cards, the emperor, the nine of cups and the 10 of coins represent a question about spirituality. One that I had never really thought about yet. Um, and this is why it was kind of interesting now that I'm taking this trip down the spiritual side that this, this would pop up. And the question I was getting is where does your spirituality come from? And then what's the measurement from it? So it's almost like a two part question. So like the emperor, again, like we've, we've built it, right? We've, we've, we, the grain stores are full. The, you know, the, the, the morals and ethics are set. The, you know, these types of things, if we want to take it from a civilization viewpoint to a personal viewpoint, we've built the foundation, but how do we manage it? Right? Well, we have the nine of cups here and the nine of cups is like, Hey man, like great things could come of this. And the 10 of coins is like, give it, are you fulfilled in that idea? Like let's, let's use a, a, 
you know, like I said in the beginning of this, ep- you know, every episode starts with, you know, come get triggered on the Taming Hindrance podcast. So maybe this might t- trigger some people, but let's ask this question to give a, you know, let's put it on the Christian side of things. What's the fucking point of you going to church every week if it doesn't do anything for you? Like, that's the question here is like, where does your spirituality come from? Does it come from this feel good feeling of like, oh yeah, I went to church. That was good. Like, are you just like checking off a box? You know? So with that comes the second question. What's the measurement of your spirituality? Like what does true spirituality measure up to for you? Is it this feeling of fulfillment? Is it this feeling of, I don't know, like those are the questions, right? Like that has to be part of the conversation if we want to talk to spirit about spirituality. So same thing for, you know, the Muslim community, like just to go to, you know, do to not even going to the mosque is your daily prayer. Does that fulfill you in any way? Like, are you getting anything out of that? One of the most uh, amazing stories I ever uh, heard, uh, and it was, it was, one-on-one personal conversation I was having was with this individual who had kind of lost his faith in uh, Judaism. Um, He, you know, had been raised a Hasidic Jew and kind of had lost that along the way, you know, a lot of issues with his family. Um, And in his older, you know, later in life, not much, I mean, he wasn't much older than me, but he was probably going into his late thirties. And I was probably 23, 24 at the time. Um, so, you know, it wasn't a huge gap. Like we, we could come together on like cultural things and, you know, music and, you know, we talked about stuff, but, but he would tell me that he was getting back into, uh, the Hasidic prayers that he had learned as a, as a child. And one of the things in the Hasidic prayers that they do is there's a, it's, it's, it's very personal setup. So you'll get out your, um, usually a hand woven rug, uh, very similar to what you would find in the Muslim faith you know, would lay the rug out or, you know, carpet piece out in front of you. You get on your knees and you pray. And in the Hasidic style, there's this rocking back and forth uh, that this individual had never, never done before, never felt the necessity. But he, he told me that he remembered watching some of the older um, individuals do this, specifically some of the rabbi that he would watch, they would do this. And it was this rocking back and forth. And once he like experienced that, he, that's when he said things changed for him, that his, his beliefs and his faith were more than just a practice. It had substance. It had material aspect. So that's where these, these questions come from with these three cards, the emperor, the nine of cups and the 10 of coins is that question of, to me at least is this question of, you know, where, where does the faith or, or where does your spirituality come from? Like, and what's the measurement of its sub, like substance so or substance, you, you know, in modern society, we look a lot at materialism, right? And people, people measure their wealth based on material measures, you know, cars, they drive clothes, they wear sweet Instagram pics. They were in, um, you know, the amount of booze they can drink. It's all measured in these materialistic ideas. And I'm not saying being materialistic is a bad idea. If it gets you through life, Hey, fuck it. Like who am I to tell you that's wrong? Um, and I've definitely been one in my life to very much covet wealth. Um, knowing the difference between money and wealth is an important statement. And maybe I'll get into that towards the end of this podcast as I go into one of my usual rants, but for now staying on topic, hopefully there is a big, a, a big piece of modern society based on materialism. Uh, that's what all marketing is based on. So yeah, we're pushed into that. But if we had to take that idea, at least, you know, sometimes people will, will they'll bash that idea. Well, let's bastardize that idea instead. Let's take that idea and bastardize it. So if we bastardize the idea of materialism and I'm asking these questions of, you know, where does your spirituality come from and what's its measurement What's your materialistic measurement of your spirituality? What does that look like to you? Is that just having the cross on the, on the, you know, hanging on the wall? Is that, you know, is that wearing the hijab? Is that, um, showing up, you know, showing up to the mosque? You know, is it, is it 
and I mean, again, I'm, mean, you know, I'm always kind of talking about the Abrahamic religions, but let me, uh, let's put it in the Buddhist perspective. If you're a, a more than just a, a, a normal, well, I shouldn't say normal. If you're more than just a philosophic Buddhist practitioner, if you're a, a spiritual Buddhist practitioner, is that wearing your mala beads? Um, you know, is it a lot of these things we, we call out as cultural appropriation, right? And that's a big topic um, in modern society, this whole idea of cultural appropriation. In my personal opinion, it's been blown out of the, it's been blown out of the fucking water. It's just huge explosion of like, this is cultural appropriation and no one has any idea what that fucking means, nor does anyone actually feel it. Here's why. Remember why is a spiritual question. Cultural appropriation has to do with the spiritual process of a culture. And this is where these cards kind of led me into this slight aha moment that I'm almost having as this podcast is going along this episode and this, this whole, you know, adventure into this podcast, just like the human body has its vast array of genetical coding and, and muscle groups and bones and all of the stuff that make up it. So too does spirituality. So a culture itself can have a spiritual representation. That's where the realm of cultural appropriation falls, in my personal opinion. Now, I'm sure people get all pissed off about that, but come get triggered on the Taming Hindrances podcast. This is what this is about. I just want to have these conversations because I don't think we should shy away from them, nor do I think we should go to war over them. Like, why can't we have the conversations? So that being said, I, I'm probably leaving that a little bit too short, but I'll, I'll try to come back to it as we go along here. Um, we're almost 20 minutes in, so I want to make sure I get into passion, right? The, this episode's about passion. And I think this will touch on what I'm talking about when I talk about the cultural appropriation as a spiritual. It's a why question. Why is it a cultural appropriation? We have to talk about what the spirituality represents there. So let's talk about passion. Merriam-Webster's Dictionary, definition for passion. There's quite a few. We're going to go through almost all of them. Uh, the first use of passion comes from the Bible. Uh, and we talk about the passion of Christ. And passion is synonymous. Synony, well, I'm not even going to try to say that right right now. Uh, it's a synonym of suffering in the Bible. So we talk about the passions of Christ were the sufferings of Christ between the Last Supper and the, and His death uh, or her death. We, I'm still out on the I'm still on the fence on that one. Um, it's also an oratorial tale. Uh, so the narrative of the passion. Um, another obsolete definition from old English is suffering. Passion means to suffer or to be in suffering. Another definition is the state or capacity of being acted on by external agents or forces, something like moldable. Um, so to be in, to be in passion of something, to be in passionated or to be impassioned is for an oratory. An oratory is someone uh, who's like, you can think of an orator as the individual back in olden days, you know, the friar, the person on the corner speaking the news or our news agents um, or our news um, hosts in today's modern society are orators. They're, they're storytellers. They're, you know, sharers of word. They, you could be in a state or capacity of being acted upon by them. That would be to be impassioned. That's to have been talked to by an order. You know, this is what we get into the realm of coercion, corruption, falsity, lies, spreading misinformation. I know that's a touchy subject nowadays, misinformation, you know. So going on, uh, another definition is it's an emotion. Passion is an emotion. It's, it's one of the, the higher uh, complex emotions. And, you know, it's, a, it's a, a plural. So you can have passions. It's a plural emotional set. Um, it's an intensive driving or overmastering feeling of conviction. That's the, that's the definition of the emotional passion is again, a, an intensive driving or overmastering feeling of conviction or sorry, feeling or conviction. Uh, it's an outbreak of anger, you know, to be, to be passionate can have an outbreak of anger. Uh, another definition is an ardent affection. Also, that's another definition of love. So to ardently be affect, in affection of something, a strong liking or desire for or devotion to some activity, object, or concept. Uh, some might say that's an obsession. So 
you know, there's sexual desire. Uh, there's an object or desire of deep interest. So, you know, we use, oh, I'm so passionate about this. Think about those definitions. Are you passionate about something? And we talk about our passions. To be passionate about something is to be willing to suffer for it. Think about that. To be passionate about something is to be willing to suffer for it. That would be my collective definition of everything I just went over. So when, when I talk about that, let's jump back to the things that I'm just telling, to, you know, saying out loud to piss people off and to make them think about things. When we talk about cultural appropriation and we talk about it in the spiritual sense of something. To be passionate about that is to be willing to suffer for it. To be so emboldenedly convicted to something that you're willing to suffer for that idea. Flip that around for a second. If someone of another culture is willing to suffer the xenophobia that comes along with practicing something from another culture, which is very typical in today's society has gotten less, but you know, the late, 1980s, early 1990s into the 2000s, a lot of people in the West thought it was weird to even think about like Eastern cultures or Mid-Eastern cultures. And then beyond that, you know, let's talk about the fake, you know, war on um, weapons of mass destructions that we, you know, we created that whole fucking bullshit. You know, we really just wanted to invade Iraq to bomb it into the fucking Stone Age for some reason. Um, I'll digress on that. But there's more to it to that, and I don't want to disregard the sacrifices that occurred with that, but some very powerful people made some very stupid, selfish decisions to get us there. Um, with that, we had a huge xenophobia in the West because of 9-11 with uh, anything Muslim-related. So someone who was born in America, raised here their entire life as a Muslim— practicing the Muslim prayers. They were like, who the fuck are you? What are you, what the fuck are you doing? That's not right. That's not okay. They had passion. They were willing to suffer through that diversity. And no, they're not from the middle East. They were born here in America. That makes them an American. So, uh, you know, I'm, I know I'm picking out very nuanced and very, uh, you know, tough topics and I'm making them a little too simple, but that's the idea we have to look at there. So when you talk about cultural appropriation, everything is cultural appropriation. If you want to have a, if you want to have an argument about cultural appropriation, I'm going to go right down to the cuisine you eat. If you want to have a hard talk about cultural appropriation, and I'm not saying it doesn't exist. What I'm saying is if you want to, if you want to stand on that, that hill and you want to fight that battle, you then need to have passion about it, which means you are need to be willing to suffer. And to do that, you must only eat your ethnic cuisine from the location in which you live in. And if you want to go all the way down to the very nitty gritty of it, if you grew up in Pennsylvania, you don't eat anything from any other state other than the things that are Pennsylvanian there's an option or New Jersey or Texas, or, you know, let's, let's use, let's, let's put a little humor into this. If you want to talk about cultural appropriation to and go down that route, you would go down so far to the point where you would only eat Texas barbecue and couldn't eat any other Texas barbecue. I'm sorry. You would eat Texas barbecue and couldn't even eat any other barbecue, anything that would be considered non-Texas barbecue. You wouldn't be allowed to eat it because if you did, you lose your argument. Because your passion will have dissolved. Your willingness to suffer for what you believe in will have dissolved. This is the basis of morals and ethics and how we go about our daily lives in some ways. So again, coming back to the cards before I piss too many people off here. The emperor, the nine of cups, and the ten of coins, right? Where does your spirituality come from? what is its measurements, right? Well, let's add to that. So, I, you know, I typically like to pick another card to kind of give a clarification. And the fourth card I picked, or not picked, but the fourth card that came out was the three of swords. 
And the Three of Swords is uh, an interesting card. I'm just going to describe it here for a second. It's there's this uh, picture of this you know woman with very f- big broad hair, and there's a heart, and there's three swords piercing through the heart. Um, so it's kind of like the bleeding heart idea, and the representation here is, you know, ultimately what is your heart? Um, but with that, there's this idea of, we want truth. Um, the three of swords is a representation of like, we want truth and we want truth of communication. We want truth of experience. We want truth of information. And with that comes the warning of, are you being true to yourself? Because that's really, I mean, you have to think about this. So the tarot deck comes from this story of the fool traveling through the, you know, the the adventure of self-awareness, essentially, and learning things about themselves. And the three of heart is, you want answers and you want truth, but are you willing to look at it? Are you willing to, are you willing to accept what is actually true? If it, are you, are you going to run away from the truth or are you going to accept it? And the truth is, there's no answer. The truth is a lot of people are quote unquote prostrating themselves on bullshit arguments, thinking that they'll get some sort of entertainment out of it, thinking that they'll get some sort of publicity out of it, thinking they'll get some sort of, some sort of acknowledgement from it. And the reality is it's bullshit because they don't actually believe what they're saying. They have no passion. They have no willingness to suffer. If you want to talk about passion, someone like Gandhi had passion. Someone like Rosa Parks had passion. Someone like, I don't know. This might piss some people off. Someone like Fidel Castro had passion. Um, I like to use obscure references because it, it makes people wake up to these ideas. You know, it's kind of that shock treatment with words. Um, some, uh, that's a tough one because I can't really say if they did or not. Let's not use that one. So yeah, even I have to be a little bit careful about the ones I pick because I don't know truly if they did or not. Um, but you know, th- that I, these people had passion. They were willing to suffer. Um, the reality of the story of the Nassau pirates. Um, they were, they had passion, the Nassau pirates, pirates of Nassau, um, in the, uh, Caribbean, Bahamas, whatever. It doesn't matter. Um, their passion was to not be under anyone's rule. They didn't want to be under British rule. They didn't want to be under Spanish rule. And they certainly didn't want to be tied to, um, the stuff that was going on in the Americas at the time. They wanted freedom. Their passion was freedom. So the Nassau pirates, that's how they lived. They lived for freedom. Now, were they morally and ethically correct by raiding merchant ships, by, you know, having very few rules of of law, uh, by raiding the coastlines of the Americas, uh, specifically like Johnstown and, and, and those ports, um, who knows? I mean, that's for, that's, that's for you to decide, but they certainly had passion. They were certainly willing to suffer. I mean, anyone flying a black flag or anyone flying even a Port Royal flag when the Port Royal, um, quote unquote Navy, or really what was uh, mercenary ships flying under the same flag came together would have been sunk instantaneously by a, a, a British frigate, if possible, or a British galley. You know, these are the things that are truly passion. Uh, and this idea of passion is a tough topic for personal awareness, for personal self-awareness, for looking inward at yourself. You have to look at this three of hearts, or I'm sorry, uh, three of swords. Are you willing to look at the truth here? Cause I'm not saying that I'm completely truthful and I'm, I'm, you know, I'm the B end and I'll say, but if you're not even willing to look at my perspective of it, if you're not willing to look at the things I'm, I'm asking you or the things I'm you know saying as a possibility or, or at least make them let you think about something, then you need to exit 
the conversation. And maybe you need to go have a personal conversation with yourself, but you're exiting the conversation. You're running away from the possibilities of truth. And that's where, you know, I argued the coercion and the corruption that has happened in the spiritual realm is that creation is the beginning. And it's not, I, 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 I am passionate. I will, I'm willing to suffer the arguments and I'm willing to suffer, you know, the hatred from some certain religious groups that creation has nothing to do with the beginning. Creation is only a beginning of itself. It, it's its own self-serving prophecy. The reality of the beginning is it comes from chaos. It comes from infinite possibility. And the infinite possibility is we live in a world where cultural appropriation is going to happen no matter what. It's the intention behind it is the most important part. And we have to start looking at intentions because intentions are ruled by these passions that we have, the true passions. So when I've talked about before about awareness and how awareness is defined by the attention to intentions, this has everything to do with watching people's passions. What is someone passionate about? What are they willing to suffer for? The people who go to the gym constantly and they beat up their body, the professional sports athletes, the even the CrossFitters out there, sometimes as much as I bash on them, sometimes um, they're passionate about this thing known as health and uh, health and wellness. That's their passion. They're willing to suffer because of it. They're willing to suffer the aches, the pains, the muscle burn, the fatigue, the being out of the breath to get fit, to be at a higher fitness level. Individuals getting their doctorates are willing to suffer through all of the bullshit that goes along with getting a doctorate and being indoctrinated into the Western education system or the collegiate education system, depending on where they're going to school. And that whole bullshit world of, you know, do it our way because we said to do it our way. If you don't do it our way, we don't want to talk to you. You know, the old boys club mentality, the, you know, that crap. When I was a Mason, I didn't go on with it because I didn't, I wasn't willing to suffer. I, w I had no passion to be a Mason. I had a lot of questions I wanted to answer and they didn't have the answers to them. Or if they did, I wasn't willing to be passionate enough for them to give them to me because I didn't believe in their system of, of truth, um, secret secrecy. <laughs> you know, I, I didn't believe in the way they disseminated information. There we go. Something like the Vatican. Are you so passionately Catholic that you believe that the Va it's okay for the Vatican to withhold information from the public because the Vatican believes they own it? There's all sorts of stuff hidden under the Vatican. Historical records, documents, art pieces, you know, archaeological finds, wealth. The Vatican just hides it from the public. They don't believe that we don't they don't believe that anyone has a right to it but their version of God. That's their passion. Well, let's talk about that situation where passions start to collide. This is the story of cultural appropriation. This is the story of, is it okay? And I'm using, again, I'm using like really obscure, crazy references to make people think harder about this stuff and hopefully to piss people off because at some point in time, you got to get angry, not riot and hurt each other angry, but get angry at yourself. Get angry for not understanding what your position is. Because until you do that, you can't have passion. You can't have the ability to want to suffer for what you believe in. And that's what we're lacking here. This is when I talked about effort. I was missing this piece. I was missing the piece about effort where to put in effort is the most important part. And to be willing to suffer to put in that effort is even more important. We get into these passions and, and we're deep diving here. We're going real deep into it. So this three of swords idea of, are you willing to suffer for the truth and also suffer the truth? This is the differentiation. And I'm actually stealing this from the mystical manga, uh, the text by Barbara Moore to love a flower is, you know, you can love a flower multiple ways. Or to like a flower, you know, you can pick it. To love a flower, you would water, I think is the quote they use. And I don't know where that quote comes from. But I thought it was very interesting. To like a flower, you pick the flower, right? To love a flower, you water it. You put in the effort to grow the flower. And we all know how I feel about love, but I, I thought it was an interesting idea or a parable of effort and passion. You can put in the effort of picking a flower, and now you just have a flower. That's great. Or you can have the passion 
to suffer through the time and the continuous necessary effort to make a flower grow. Or if we're going back to the emperor, the empress had the passion to build the, build the community, plant the fields, even before that, to till the fields, then plant the fields, then you know, to fertilize the fields, and then to harvest the, all this effort. And then the emperor puts in the suffering of the possibility that the people might hate the ruling party because they did the right thing, not the wrong thing. Hate the ruling party if they did the wrong thing. Our ruling parties don't do the right thing, in my personal opinion. They don't suffer. What suffering does any of our politicians go through it today? They don't suffer. They live in wealth and squalor and, and fucking outside of the rules of normal societal culture and, and law. They don't suffer. There's no suffering there. It should be sufferable to be a part of that. It should be, have to be a passion. It should suck. It should be hated. It should just be like, it should be jury duty. Becoming a senator or any form of, or a house representative, becoming the president should be like fucking jury duty. You should hate every second of it, but know that there's that, that nine of cups and 10 of coins moment there, the fulfillment of it. That's passion. So what is, so I'm going to take this one step further and we're going to, we're going to elevate it up into the spiritual level, right? What is the heart of spirituality? What is the heart of your spirituality? Just like the heart is the, is the epicenter of what keeps the, you know, yeah, we have the brain. That's great. But the brain is kind of this duality piece of like, yeah, it's sending signals, but it's a translation point between our, our mental state, our consciousness, our depression and our body. The heart though, the heart is the epicenter of the body. It is what keeps everything running. It's the emperor. It It's, it's tell okay. I need blood flow here. We got to move there. That's great. The Empress has, the Empress has provided us all of this fruition. That's what the Empress does. She runs, she runs society. She runs community. She runs the, the, she runs the empire. The emperor helps do the, the moving and the shaking and the, and the positioning. And, 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 you know, that's what the heart does. So it isn't, it is the empress and the emperor, but the emperor is that, that idea of the heart is that epicenter moment is that what's in my heart, right? That's a conversation we have in, in mysticism and spirituality and in, you know, the yoga practices with the chakra system and meditation, you know, systems and all these things. What's in your heart. We talk about it with, in, um, the Christian communities, they talk about, do you have Jesus in your heart? You know, do you have God in your heart? In the Muslim communities, to open your heart to Allah, you know, um, to, uh, to, to express heartfelt nature for Muhammad. Um, in the Judaic communities, to have, you know, God in your heart or, you know, to have, um, have the, uh, I can't think of the correct word, I apologize. But, there, you know, there's, there's specific words about, the expression of the heart um, in Jainism, which is uh, probably the best, uh, in my opinion, the best understanding of Dharma and karma and all these things. The heart is that epicenter of the, not only just the emotions and those types of things, but also of the Dharmic cultivation and, and also the, the, the centerpiece is to like, you know, to, they can talk about awakening the heart's flame, the flame in the heart. Um, and then there's meditations about going into, and there's these also in Buddhism in some cases about talking about, um, breathing into the heart and clearing out that the temple of the heart and lighting the flame, um, to burn away all of the, the rot and the, you know, all of these things that has to do with emotional awareness and, and understanding. That's what we talk about with the body and the mind connection. So what's the heart of spirituality? That's another thing these, these cards are asking is those two questions. What's your spirituality look like? And what is spiritual familiar? Uh, what is spiritual abundance? Look like, what is it measured by? How do you measure it? Stepping back into the two of the conversations I probably shouldn't even get into, but I did anyway. So fuck it. No, yeah, now, now I'm in it. Cultural preparation. I have to ask, 
is it wrong for the teenage kid to really like another culture and to like buy the cultural clothing, to watch the cultural, you know, to do the cultural music, to do the dance? Like, is that wrong? Is, is that wrong? Is that a cultural appropriation? Is a Western individual wearing a garb from another culture wrong? I believe the answer to that question can be absolutely yes. I really do. I I do believe there are versions of cultural appropriation. Where's the discernment though? Where's the discernment between, yeah, that asshole is just wearing that to look cool and make themselves, you know, like, like, Oh wow. Look at them. They're amazing. Like, cool. They're trying to be so sneaky and and like, Oh, that look, you know, that's probably the answer. There's probably, yes, that's cultural appropriation. But where's the discernment for that? There's no repercussions to actions or words anymore. There really isn't. The the social media got rid of that. And then we had this whole thing with cancel culture and wokeism and all this other stuff. These are what I believe to be attempts at answers to dealing with passions. People get passionate. They really do. Sometimes they don't know why. Remember, one of the definitions of passion is an outbreak of anger. So yes, people get passionate and they don't know how to direct it correctly. The first thing you need to do there is understand where your passion comes from. That question has to do with what's the heart of your spirituality? Is it your culture? (gasps) Did he just say that? Yes, I said that because I believe culture can be a very spiritual thing for people. In fact, spirituality is like ingrained and woven into and like, and like baked into the bread of culture. That spirituality is just a part of that. So we have the spiritual practices of China, of Japan, of India, of Russia, of Siberia, of the Mongolian Empire, of the, you know, the Sikhs, you know, we have the Hindus, we have, you know, we have the spiritual processes of Iraq, Iran, uh, Turkey, Tehran, uh, you know, I lack the knowledge of all the different countries that go into all that, but then we have the, you know, Eastern and we have the ancient, you know, these are all ancient ideas as well, but we also have the ancient ideas of, you know, pre-civilization Germany of the, you know, Hadrian's wall, the Northern Germanic tribes, Roman empire. We have the Grecian empire. We have the Italy and the Egyptian culture. There's a huge one to unpack. There's spirituality woven into that. That's the conversation of cultural appropriation. So we have to talk about the heart of culture. We have to talk about the heart of civilization. We have some choices to make. We have some really fucking hard choices to make in that regard. And the choices that have to be made in that situation are, do we believe in xenophobia? Do we believe that someone of any other culture cannot celebrate the culture of someone else's culture because they're not a part of that culture. Is it wrong to celebrate someone else's culture? I can't answer that for you, nor will I answer that question. The reason I won't answer that question because my belief doesn't fucking matter. Your belief is what matters. What's your heart of your spirituality? Is it your culture? Is it your family? Is it the, you know, is it the way of your upbringing? I have no heart in family. Could, couldn't give a shit about my family. We don't talk. We don't speak. I feel great about that. You know, I, no, I'll never have the outlet that I really wish. Do Does some part of me wish I could have thrown a punch in my dad's face? Absolutely. Yeah, there's some definite things that I would love to have just cold clocked him for. Is that the right answer to me, though? No, I'm not a violent person in that regard. Could there be a conversation to subside that? Possibly, yeah. Does it need to happen now? No. Do I have a dream about it every once in a while that I have to be like, wow, do I really feel that way? Yeah. But that's my subconscious trying to deal with these things. So I have to ask myself, what's the heart of my spirituality? Am I a violent person? No, I don't think so. But what's the heart of my spirituality? News fucking flash, everybody. I don't know. I'm still trying to figure that out. So don't think I'm some like, you know, I'm not trying to stand on like a top of a milk crate here and like have this big fucking orator moment of, you know, like the newscasters telling you what you need to believe in and what's absolutely true. No, that's not, that's not what I'm trying to do. 
what I'm trying to do is make you think about the things that really matter, the things that I think will help you, will help better you, will help better civilization, will help better community, will help better the things that we really need to focus on. Because we've gotten so caught up in this whirlwind control structure of everything you do matters on this massively grand scale and everything in the grand scale is really who you are. And it's not because they have no passion. They have no heart. Politicians are heartless people. Correction. Career politicians are heartless people. They don't have any true passion. Their passion is wealth. Their passion is money. Their passion is power. Those aren't spiritual things. In fact, that is what every spirituality version of the canonical writings or Christianity, Judaism, Muslim, uh, Jainism, Hinduism, uh, Shinto Buddhism, uh, the Native American cultures, or, or really what is sovereign American cultures. Um, all of these cultures or spiritual processes warned against these things. Don't be someone who covets materialism. Don't be someone who wants to create hatred and, and war and, and hurt others for the benefit of yourself. Don't steal from others. And stealing includes taking, you know, ideas or opportunity away from someone. These are the things our cultures, our spiritual natures have warned against. So again, what's the heart of your spirituality? What does your spirituality look like? Like, where does it come from? And at the same time, what's it measured by? That was ultimately a deciding factor in the Crusades. It was all these orators, these, these people who could whip people up into, oh, there's a great example, the whip uh, in the political parties uh, the individual who's like leads their, you know, the Senate population or the House, the whip, the majority whip, they're orators. They, they try to like get everybody riled up on the same page and, you know, whip them into doing, you know, what they believe is the right thing. It's coercion. It's corruption inside of the party itself. The Crusades were that very thing. People were talked into having passion who weren't passionate. They had no, they had no skin in the game of this. They weren't willing, they were willing to suffer, but what were they suffering for? Were they, you know, they were, they were coerced into suffering for something that wasn't true. The Christian communities were not going to be overrun by the Muslim communities. There was something else going on. Let's step forward in time. Let's go over every, you know, if you really wanted to get into it, let's get a collegiate level course together where we talk about the reference points of all of the wars that have ever been fought and what were the passion points were for the individual warriors. Those who were convinced to go to war over a certain situation actually fight and die. That was the answer. What did they believe the passions were for? Because you want to look at a modern one. We got a lot of soldiers who have come back from the Iraq war and they're kind of like, what the fuck was I fighting for? And that's not the wrong answer. I'm not trying to belittle anyone in the armed services. I kind of grew up as a military brat. So like, not that I, I can't understand. I cannot, I've never been to war. I've never been through, you know, I'm never, I've never even been through boot camp. So like, I don't know their depression on that. But I have met individuals who stated like they were fine with being there because it came down to protecting their, their sister or their brother next to them. That was the fight for them was to protect the person next to them. That's what they were fighting for on overall. But the, the impassionment of yeah, weapons of mass destruction and they, they didn't believe in any of that. Like Afghanistan was a perfect example of that. So their passion in that moment and, and, you know, when it came down to it, came down to the idea of they were just fighting for the person next to them. They just wanted to make sure their jobs essentially at that point were to make sure they got home to their family and the person next to them got home to their family. That was their passionate moment. And I think a lot of war comes down to that. 
that individuals find themselves in these moments of warfare and all of the things that got them there turn into lies or turn into ash in their mouth. And so they, they attach themselves to a more higher purpose. And in that moment, that higher purpose is protecting the individual next to you, making sure they get home to their family, making sure you get home to your, you know, those are the real situations where the mind, the body and the spiritual nature come together. And overall, that says a lot. That says, what's the defining moment? And that's the, that's the three of hearts. I'm sorry, I keep saying three hearts. That's the, the, the three of swords. What's the truth here? The truth in warfare is how you got into that moment is probably bullshit and could have been left alone or it could have been dealt with differently, but you're there now. And so you have to make the tough decisions of, well, shit, I'm here and I'm in a state of warfare. What's my reason for fighting? Why am I fighting? That question is a spiritual question. So it goes to what's the heart of your spirituality? And in that warfare moment, I think if I got the option, if, if I got the ability to talk to veterans, if I got the ability to talk to service men and women, service people from any nation, any culture, any time period, I mean, it'd be a fascinating discussion, but I think I would start to find a a commonality that there's this want for survival, right? There's this want for, well, I got to survive. Obviously I'm in, I'm in a state of warfare, so I'm going to fight back. I can either, I can either, you know, that's the fight or flight syndrome of, you know, what makes a warrior. Like I can curl up in a ball and die, leave my family, you know, to fend for themselves. You know, if we go back to ancient culture and we go back to like, you know, uh, you know, medieval, I can let someone ransack my village. I can lose my farmland. You know, I, I could run away. I could let that happen. And, you know, or I can try. I can put an effort and I can fight back, right? The reasonings become very specific. They become very culturally oriented, but also community oriented. And the bigger reasons go right out the fucking window. Yeah, you might have been conscripted by King George. But like most of them were like, this is fucking bullshit. I mean, ask the Scots. There's a great one. Ask the Scots how they felt about King George conscripting them. Not very happy in the end, right? These stories, these ideas, these, you know, we look at parables from ancient time periods that we can't even verify. Why aren't we looking at parables from today's modern society? And yes, I, I consider medieval times modern society because we have historical records from them. We have writings and be them true or not. And yeah, we all know how I feel about the reality of our history and how it's been rewritten. And there's a lot we don't know. Again, go ask the Vatican, uh, go ask the Smithsonian about all the shit, you know, they're hol holding on to that they could release to the public, but they don't even ask modern archaeological or um, yeah, modern archaeological societies that. You know, what have you found? What you, you know, just recently I read a news article about how, and who knows if it's true anymore, but we're looking at paleo uh, and dating that backwards another million years. Holy shit. Holy shit. Are you kidding me? To, pr to redate a, what we consider a modern representation of pre- well, not pre-hominid, but pre um, our lineage another million years backwards. What else do we need to like redate? What else do we need to go relook at? Like, these are the things that I have to start asking questions about. So I go into what's the heart of your spirituality? Because this is really kind of like when they talk about what's your internal compass, what's your subconscious. 
you know, that's kind of what these, these old anecdotal stories, that's what we're talking about. So why don't we have para, parable stories of modern society? Why doesn't that exist? Because we don't want to look at it. We want to be cool on Instagram. We want to be cool on Twitter. We want to get a thousand likes. We want to get a million retweets. So we come up with these big, bold statements. Cultural appropriation. I would say it's probably a 50-50 split between the people who are actually making that statement and believe it and have passion behind it are willing to suffer because of it and other individuals who just want to like get likes and get, you know, get thumbs up. 50-50 split. The problem with that is the people who are legitimate in their concerns and are having a tough time dealing with that are now just being completely overshadowed by the people who are just like, Give me more likes. Give me more thumbs up. Give me more, you know, more me, more me, more me. The selfishness is just overtaking it. So, yeah, I don't have the answer is there's no answer. I've said that before. The answer is there's no answer. On that scale. It might be cultural appropriation to wear a Nigerian headdress on the red carpet at the Met Gala. That might be cultural appropriation. I have no idea. I'm not Nigerian. I can't make that decision. I can't have passion about that. I guess, to be honest, I don't even believe I could have, I don't believe I have the cultural structure to have anything to say about any of that. I just bring it up as examples to piss people off and make them think about it. And maybe that's cultural appropriation. Maybe I'm in the wrong. Maybe I should be canceled. Who knows? The problem with that outlook, though, and this is where I'm trying to make it a little bit more grander and try to give you that understanding of what I'm talking about here and why I use those examples is the problem with that outlook and the problem with that cancel culture idea, that wokeism culture idea, is not that they're wrong. They're just not suffering in any way, so they have no substance. The Buddha said life is suffering. The answer to that is to choose how you suffer. Mahatma Gandhi caused great suffering. He beat his wife. He was a piece of shit. He looked inwardly and figured out this isn't, this isn't right action. This is not right mind. This is not, you know, right. This wasn't his, his definition of who he was spiritually. So yeah, we always tell the story about how like, oh yeah, he goes to the cave and he meditates and he comes back and he, you know, leaves the uh, Indian population against British rule and uses something called um, uh, passive disobedience, you know, lets the British uh, soldiers beat the shit out of him, but doesn't fight back in any way. And just, you know, they look at it and go like, oh, this is horrifying. Why are we doing this? That was his suffering. That was his passion. He created a passion inside of himself to say, be the change you want to see in the world. He wanted to see the Indian empire outside of the rule of the British empire. And not, not just the Indian, he wanted to see, because the Indian empire had kind of already sold themselves to the British empire in that regards at the higher levels. But he wanted to see the Indian populace, the people free of the British tyrannical rule. And that's true to a lot of cultures. Ask the Australians, ask the Bohemians, ask the um, Caribbeans, ask ask the uh, ask the original American um, immigrants. You know, because that's what we were. We were immigrants. Then we had the sovereign Americans, known as the Native Americans nowadays. Then we had Americans who immigrated from England and became Americans, quote unquote. They were like, "Fuck British rule. We're done with this shit." Um, Ask the French in regards to the, um, shit, I'm going to blank on this one. I apologize. Uh, the Mar, 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 I'm close. I know I'm close. You can Google it. It'll, it'll come up. Uh, Mar, I think, I believe it's Mardici. Um, I'm close, but not quite on that one. Uh, let's look at, I mean, we could just look at, you know, modern China, the rule of the Manchus. You know, and and so like there's all of these parab- the parables, anecdotal stories of the people, 
the people. The people. You're one of the people. Because I'm pretty sure if you're not, you wouldn't be listening to this. Because I bash on all the upper hands a lot. You know, I'm pretty sure if you're listening to this, you might totally be into wokeism and think it's a great idea. But you don't believe in the leaders of the woke crowd. You don't believe in their actions. You might be passionate about the message. Just like Black Lives Matter. You can be absolutely passionate about the message. It's a great message. It's a fucking amazing message. But you might not agree with how the higher ups are going about it. You might not agree with Antifa trying to make themselves a part of that and then doing riots and, you know, burning black owned businesses and creating disruption and all that stuff. You might not agree with the leaders of the organization, not the message, but the organization buying million dollar homes and building fences around them in gentrified areas and saying that somehow makes it okay. Cause the, you know, they're taking real estate away from the whites. This is the idea of passion. This is the idea of what the heart of your spirituality is. What is the heart of your spirituality? Could be your culture. Because there's some amazing fucking cultures out there. I'll give you one right now. The Ethiopian culture, amazing diverse individuals. Fantastic food lineage. I just, you know, use of, let's talk about just like use of land and, you know, survival methods. Just amazing. Absolutely amazing. Astonishing. Aboriginal Australians, pff, fucking crazy. Talk about whole island because I mean technically it's an island, but we know it's you know continent of Australia, whatever. But whole fucking landmass is trying to kill you all the time. Everything there wants to eat you, poison you, or break you down in some way, including the land itself. In some cases, um, the sovereign Americans, the Native Americans, come on, just an amazing historical cultural reference. And I'm not saying this just to be like, oh yeah, he's prostrating on like, oh, like, you know, trying to make, no, these are fascinating cultural references. Just like young me was totally into the Japanese culture and the Chinese culture and the Korean culture and like all of these Eastern cultures. And I thought their methodologies and their ways of living and, and, you know, the respect structures they had for one another and the family unit and, all the things I was lacking in my life, they had, and they were taught from very little. And yes, there's sexist in, you know, issues there. And yes, cultures have problems, people. Cultures have problems. One of the most, the, one of the biggest cultural appropriations of all history was the Roman Empire. They absorbed everything. How about the Mongols? They absorbed everything. So like, these are the conversations. Like, I, I just don't, under, I, I don't understand why people don't look a little harder. Well, I do understand, but I wish people would. I, I fucking nine of cups. People would look at what's the definition of these words. What do they really mean? What am, what am I actually saying? And what backs it up? What's your passion? What are you willing to suffer for? I'm going to go through the definitions again, as I usually do. I like to re recap over them. Definitions of passion of passion comes from one of the oldest uses is the passion of Christ, which is again, uh, in the story in the, in the anecdotal story of Jesus, there's the last supper and his death and the, and the suffering that happens in between that nailed to the cross, blah, 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 the whole story. I'd rather talk about the suffering of the women who opened the tomb and brought his, you know, quote unquote, lifeless body out, ripped the veil of the church and wrapped him in it. There's a story for you. Um, those women suffered greatly by the hands of the Roman soldiers. You know, okay, let's continue. Obsolete definition of passion. Suffering. Another definition. The state or capacity of being acted on by external agents or forces. To be oratored. It's an emotion. It's a fucking outbreak of anger. It's an intense driving or overmastering feeling or conviction. It's an ardent affection. Commonly referred to as love. A strong liking or desire for or devotion to something, some activity, object, or, con or concept. Also known as obsession. It's a sexual desire. It's an object of desire or deep interest. 
that's the one we use most often. And if you note, it's the last definition on the list is an object of desire or deep interest. That's the last definition in Merriam-Webster's dictionary. Some synonyms of passion are affection, attachment, devotedness, devotion, fondness, love. There's more, the fervor, ardor, enthusiasm, zeal. Mm, zeal a tree. There's a, there's, a, there's a complicated one. But with that, I think there's this idea of heart. Because the heart's what suffers the most. The heart can suffer so much that someone can die of a broken heart. It's actually been recorded in um, medical journals that a spouse will lose their partner I'm sorry, a partner will lose their spouse or an individual will lose their spouse and they will die of a broken heart. The heart will just fail. It will just stop. It will just slow and they will pass away. In that case, in that, that objectified area measured by, you know, there's medical writing about it. The truth of the matter, the three of swords, is that that person's passion lied in or was a part of or was defined by the connection they had to their partner. So when we look at this idea of what passion is, passion has a big thing to do with our depression because it's, it's part of how we see things. You can be so passionate about something that you become blind to the truth. That's the warning here. The three of swords. That's the warning. The cards are giving this warning. The first three cards, the emperor, the nine of cups, the ten of coins. To me, that's a question. Two questions. Where does your spirituality come from? Where does it come from? And what is its measurement? How are you measuring your spirituality? Then comes the three of swords. It's a warning. It's an answer and a warning. It's, are you looking at truth? Are you running away from it? What is your relationship to that truth? What is your relationship to that conversation? That question of where's your spirituality come from? And what is its measurement? How are you measuring it? Are you measuring it by how many likes you have on Instagram? How many thumbs up you got on YouTube? How many retweets you have on Twitter? How many shares you have on Facebook? How many followers you have? Because you know what the truest definition of all that is? You want to be a God. You want people to be devoted to you. You want people to be devoted to your musings, your thoughts, your ideas, your random Twitter fucking feed shit. You want to be a God. That has what that's the breeding ground of social media is to become godly or what we consider celebrities to celebrate something of that regard. Think about the passion there. So going back to awareness, my definition there, attention to intentions. We must pay attention to passions as well. We're going deeper now. We're looking deeper, more, more, more. Poignantly, pay attention to people's passions. Is their passion to attain pity? Is their passion to attain praise? Probably don't want to trust these people. Those are selfish, act, selfish actions. What are they willing to, what is someone willing to suffer for? That's the truest definition of passion there. You have to look at what, what are people willing to suffer for? There is such a thing known as shock marketing to do outlandish, crazy things. This is what made uh, that blonde kid famous on um, whatever platform he was on. You know, he started out doing like going and doing splits in front of people like on video. He would just like break into a split. Um, and now he's like a boxer or something. I have no idea. But see how much I care about this stuff. That was shock marketing. He used shock and awe. That's, that's the idea of magicians, shock and awe. To market. Great. 
But what are they passionate about? What are they willing to suffer for? Those are some big questions to, to look at. And before you get into looking at that, maybe you should look at what you're willing to suffer for. Again, where does your spirituality come from? What's the heart of it? And what's its measurement structure? Are you measuring your spirituality? Is it like, is there a fulfilled, not fulfilled? You know, how do we fulfill ourselves spiritually? Let me, let me, let me, let me dive a little deeper here, right? Let me go into, you know, I probably pissed some people off with the cultural appropriation thing and some of the other things I said. Here's where my mind goes with this. I'm a big fan of something called genetical eating. It's, it's um, to help your gut biome and, and to kind of get your health right with eating the things that make sense for you genetically, uh, both in, you know, the genetical sense of epigenetics, but also in the genetical sense of like where you came from, where, you know, your family, you know, your, your genetical code comes from and what the food of that area is. We call this cultural food. And the culinary world is an interesting world because it's one of the places that gets a pass more so than not. It also gets stigma and, and dogma put on top of it as well. And so you have a lot of chefs who want to share their cultural heritage and they want to use food to do that. Well, That's them sharing their spirituality. That's the measurement of their spirituality, right? That's a form of measurement of spirituality. So when we talk about how can I be fulfilled spiritually, or if we go into these cards, you know, so we have the emperor, right? So like in order for the emperor to do his job, the empress laid all the groundwork for him to do it. So in order for him to do his job, the, the groundwork must have been laid by the empress and now he must execute, Right. And what that looks like is making the correct choices. He's got all the ingredients, but now he's got to cook the dish, right? Well, we have the nine of cups. We have, you know, he's made the right choices. You've made the right choice. What do you, how you want to say this? Now you gotta, you gotta, you gotta actually do it. You actually have to have, you have to believe in this enough to actually do it. And then if you do that, if you make that leap of faith or you make that choice to cook the dish, if you, if you think, okay, like I I got this recipe down or I've invented this recipe, I think this is the right combination of these ingredients. Then you might get the nine of coins. I'm sorry, the 10 of coins. You might get like awesome. It all worked out. There's abundance, there's fulfillment, but fulfillment more of so of not just this is an amazing tasty dish of all the things that can come from that one dish. I'm going to go off into a side tangent and I'll come back for a second. But when I was learning how to cook, you know, I started as a dishwasher in a country club. Um, and then I spent some time as a line. Well, I spent a time as a line cook there as well. Um, and then eventually I, I think then I transitioned, I, I always get the timing of it wrong, but then I transitioned from uh, fine dining in the country club setting to short order cooking uh, in a bar and a pizza place. And I learned how to toss pies. And then I went back to the country club and, you know, went back into fine dining and was a pantry chef for a little while and a prep chef and then a, um, a banquet chef and then, or a banquet cook, I, you know, I should call it a, those types of things. But, and then I ended my career in the country club world as a, what would be stylized as a sous chef or a banquet chef or um, a head banquet chef or uh, also a kitchen manager. And I was also a kitchen manager at a, a, you know, in in a, in a a bar essentially. And I was again, tossing pies again. I, I bounced back between fine dining and short order cooking in the fine dining world. One of the big things I did as a banquet chef um, and running banquets both having learned how to do it, starting even from just doing pots and pans and, and, and washing dishes to then actually doing some of the prep work and then to actually like writing the menu and executing the menu and, and leading a team of individuals was I did two of the biggest celebrations you can do in a country club. And one's not really a celebration, but I've talked about it before. 
in the death episode, all the way back in episode 16, we do weddings, right? Glorious celebrations of unity and, and families and, you know, done some weddings. And with we- I've also done anniversaries, you know? So those types of celebrations, right? Well, I've also done funerals. Do the, the, the banquet for the funeral. It is a crazy idea that someone would allow a total stranger. And in some cases it wasn't a stranger. I knew a lot of the membership and I had met them and I had talked to them, but maybe not the whole family, you know, maybe I just knew the son or the daughter, or, you know, but for them to trust a kitchen staff, they've probably maybe only interacted with once or twice or never even met ever to provide one of the things that can be the most comforting things ever, the meal after a funeral. And the chef I worked for, the prophet that he was, shout out to the Napster, shout out to Nap, taught me, and also uh, shout out to Ryan because he um, he taught me this as well. He was, he was a great hash slinger. He could make tons of banquet food very quickly. Uh, we clashed on the anger side. We had passions. Our passions clashed quite often, but uh, they taught me this is almost more important than the wedding. To do a funeral banquet is almost, or maybe is actually more important than doing the wedding because you're providing one of the only things you can provide that might bring comfort for even 30 seconds. To someone who suffered loss, suffered. Remember, what's another definition for passion? Suffered. They had passion for this person. This is where passion becomes very multifaceted. That's why I'm bringing this up. And also spiritual fulfillment is coming in here at the end. That's where I started this and I will finish this, uh, this, this random sidebar. So I took a great responsibility in providing the highest level of service I could for the funerals and the weddings and everything else. But like real, like the funerals hit home for me, like really being passionate, willing to suffer, come in early, stay late, you know, recook something. If something needed to be recooked, putting what some might consider soul into this food that I was preparing for these individuals who had just suffered a loss. So that there could be some slight of slight comfort to come from it. And no, there is not a huge difference between that and someone who's just having a shitty day and wants to come home and eat one of their favorite meals or really likes ice cream and just wants to like fucking drown their sorrows in a pint of ice cream or to go out and grab a burger with their friends or, you know, food is this thing that gets a free pass. And I think it should absolutely get a free pass because it's a representation of cultures and also a sharing of culture. And that is spiritual by nature. So when I talk about like spiritual fulfillment, my story there was food can be one of those things that spiritually fulfills us. It gives us that fulfillment fulfillment. And it's also part of the heart, the heart of a culture. Food is one of the, one of the main pieces of a culture and culture is spirituality. So by sharing our food with each other, we're sharing our spiritual nature. I want people to think about that. The next time they want to talk about cultural appropriation, they want to talk about what their representation of something is. Because when you have that conversation, you edge on the form of xenophobia. And to be xenophobic would be to say, you're not allowed to eat my food. You're not allowed to live on my land. And if that's the world we want to live in, you get to make that decision. I'm not here to make the decisions for you. A wise friend of mine once said, people make choices. What I am here to ask is, is that true to you? 
Is that your truth? Is that your spirituality? Is that the heart of your spirituality? Is that the, you know, is your culture part of your spirituality of that nature that you want to hold it so passionately to suffer for it? To, you want to have pure suffrage that no one else can share in this with you. I think that's a mistake some people have made. And I'm not saying it's the wrong answer. If that's how you, you know, if, if that's what fulfills you, if that's how you want to live your life, you have to understand though, that that's not true for everyone else. And yes, I do believe there is a possibility of things becoming culturally appropri- uh, appropriated. Ask the Vatican, ask the, ask the Smithsonian, ask most museums. It's the intentions behind the act, behind the, the, the food choice, behind the dress choice, behind the statements, behind the individual trying to say hello to another individual in a different language. It's the intentions we must be of aware of. We must pay attention to. And with that, I'm adding in this next step of being aware and paying attention to the intentions that follow these passions, the willingness to suffer. And here's a big, big, big finale piece for you. If someone is adamantly willful for you to suffer, What does that say? What is that telling you? Why? Remember, big why questions, spiritual questions. Why do they believe you should suffer if they're not willing to? If we're going to have these conversations about cancel culture, wokeism, cultural appropriations, they're real conversations to have. But if someone's intention is for you to suffer because of it, they're not allowed in the conversation anymore. They've shown their true self. They have no heart in this. They have no spiritual nature to this. They literally just want you to suffer. And this goes for anything. I'm not, you know, I'm, I've been very poignant on those three pieces, but this goes to everything. I believe in the next coming couple years, people are going to have to make some tough choices about the state they live in here in the United States of America because they're not going to believe or they're not going to have, they're not going to want to suffer. They're not going to have any passion for the state they live in because the states are going to, it's going to come down to the states to make up their rules and their laws and follow those situations. And people are going to be like, I don't want to fucking live here. This is some bullshit. And they're going to have to make tough choices of where to move. I believe that's coming. I also believe that's coming on a grander scale as far as the nation states go. I think you're going to find some people that don't want to live in America anymore. Don't want to live in Britain. Don't want to live in Russia. Don't want to live in Australia. Don't want to live in China. Don't want to live in Japan. Don't want to live in the places they're living. This is what we go to war over often. And I I know I brought up the war thing before and I want to come back to it now because I've said this before, you are in war all the time. Every, every second of your life, you're in a state of war. It's a mental war. It's a psychological war, but you're in war. It's a warfare, a war for your attention. You know, when it comes to marketing, a war for your money, for your wealth, for your, you know, or there's, there's a difference between money and wealth, but there's a war for both. You know, there's a, a war for your pocket change, but also a war for your wealth. And there's a war for your time. It's all going on constantly, you're constantly in a state of war. It means you're in a state of stress and anxiety. So I don't fault people for having these choices or making these choices or having these opinions. They're opinions and they have the right to have them. And we should be talking about them constantly and never endingly. But we need to pay attention to the intentions and the passions. And if someone's passion is for you to suffer, but for them not to suffer, it's not a passion of theirs. which means they have no compassion. They are something other. In ancient cultures, these were known as demons, devils, yankai, malevolent spirits, evil gods. Our cultures have warned us about these things. We, together, as populaces have forgotten. We need to remember. We need to remember our history. We need to remember where we came from. 
We need to remember the mistakes that were made. And if we start to become passionate about those ideas, we can become passionate about some other greater ideas that come along with that passion of community. This is the introvert telling you these things. The person who would like to live on a mountain by themselves and just make their own way and never have to talk to anyone ever again, because I get anxiety about it. And although I'm a great orator, it fucking freaks me out if I'm in a group of people or if I see someone at the grocery store that knows me and they want to say hi. And then like, I just like, I want to go. Our passions should be for community togetherness. And no, we're not all going to get along and we should be passionate about that idea that we know we're not going to get all, all get along, but we can coexist. We can have differentiating opinions. We can agree to disagree. If I had to choose one thing I think people should be really passionate about is that idea. We get to agree to disagree. doesn't mean we got to stab each other. doesn't mean we got to fucking throw slanderous remarks at each other. doesn't mean we have to call someone cultural appropriation, you know, saying that they're doing that. doesn't mean we have to say that they don't respect black lives or white lives or Asian lives or yellow skin or black skin or brown skin or purple skin or green skin or fucking you know, um, doesn't mean they don't respect, you know, boomers or, or Gen Zers or these dividing lines are destroying us. Absolutely destroying us because someone else wants us to suffer and they're not willing to suffer for it. No, they think we should suffer for them. This is what's known as the monarchical rule. This is what's known as tyranny, dictatorship. We got to wake up, people. We got to wake up. I know that it gets tossed around a lot nowadays. You got to wake up. You got to wake up. Be, you know, wake up doesn't mean woke. Wake up means pay attention. The idea of waking is to wake, is to pay attention, to remember, to be in awake is to, to remember someone's life. That's what awake's about. It's also about looking internally at our spirituality. What's the heart of your spirituality? What are you passionate about? Are you passionate about your culture? Share it with everyone. Don't let it die. Share it openly and honestly. What's your truth? Do you believe in the truth of it? Share your culture. Culinary artists have been doing that a very long time now. It's an amazing, wonderful thing. And I wish they were able to do more of it. I wish the black community was able to share their food with us more. I wish they were able to even go back and show us like, here's the heirloom grains that they used to grow, you know, not just the okras and the, no, you know, some of the, some of the rices that they brought over from Africa and they grew here. Some of the wheat structures, the grains, some of the vegetables, the cooking preparation methodologies, you know, a lot of people, could benefit from learning about true cooking. There's a lot of French preparation out there. The French culture has been disseminated throughout the whole world because there's a lot of use of the of the French preparations. Let's talk about a, a you want to talk about a cultural appropriation. Here's a fucking cultural appropriation for you that nobody really knows about. The tomato is not Italian. Tomatoes are not indigenous to Italy. You want to talk about a cultural appropriation? That's a cult- cultural appropriation to say tomato sauce is Italian. It is and it isn't. So is it a right or wrong cultural appropriation? The tomato sauce represents the poor immigrant families from Italy. That's what that represents. It represents a methodology of cooking, which is actually French preparation that the Italians learned from the French to create sauces And the Italians in their ingeniousness knew how to use acidic nature for things that didn't need to be pressurized canned that they could keep in their cupboards. And so we have these ingenious Italian families and the grandmas, the, you know, that come over and they, they take this thing known as the tomato and they make a sauce out of it. And then the ingeniousness again, to work with the grain structure to make a sauce that goes on stale bread. That's the cultural representation of the tomato sauce of pizza is to say, Hey, 
I know how to make a sauce. Oh, the Italians can make some sauces. So can the French. That's where they got the French the French preparation. That's our five mother sauces are the French preparatorial ways of making sauces. And the Italians, with their infinitely diverse cultural structures from the Sicilians to the, you know, North Italians and their vineyards and and the flora and the preparations and the heritage of culture, the heritage of passing on cooking as the matriarchal line passes on their cooking preparations to both the male and female sides, you know, Italian grandmothers teach both the granddaughter and the, and the grandson how to cook. It's an important way of cultural methodology. And they bring that, that cultural representation, that spiritual nature to the Americas. And they run into the xenophobic barrier of immigration into New York city and the dividing lines. And what do they do with that? They say, fuck your dividing lines. Here's one for you. We found these things called tomatoes. We're going to harvest these tomatoes. We're going to, we're going to make things out of it. We're even going to take tomatoes back to the motherland and we're going to plant some there and come up with new things like the Roma tomato, but we're going to make these tomatoes and we're going to take these tomatoes and we're going to, we're going to make a sauce. That's what we're going to do. We're going to make a sauce. And what we're going to use that sauce for is to cover up the taste of the stale bread. Because that's all they could afford. That's all they could find was the stale bread because it was xenophobia. The different cultural elements in New York City wouldn't sell to other... It was xenophobia inside the city. They wouldn't sell to someone else or they would charge more. And you know, we have the gang fights between, you know, the Italians and the Irish and the, you know, the gangs of New York. They made a terrible movie about, but you know, I guess it wasn't a terrible movie, but there's a, a representation of the culture and heritage there. And that has to do with the spirituality. So the spiritual nature of the Italians is the spiritual nature of Italy. It's matriarchal lineage stories through cooking effort of cultivation. They're amazing farmers. Absolutely amazing farmers making do with what you had preparing for the worst. They're amazing preppers. No Italian family doesn't have a cupboard full of stuff that will get them through. They all have it. Grandmothers teach you that. With that, they learned to make the stale bread something you could use. Cover it in sauce. Add some cheese if you had it. And then you baked it to get rid of the staleness of the bread to, and then have it so it's, it's kind of carryable. And what do you get? Fucking pizza. You get fucking pizza. That's, that's what you get. You get pizza. It's not Italian. It's Italian-American. But it is Italian, but it's also American. They invented it here. Preparations and methodologies came from Italy. And then they took it back. And we get what's known as the Neapolitan because the Italians like to do things the Italian way. And the Italian way to make pizza is the Neapolitan. That's the only pizza that exists in Italy that's truly, to them, pizza is the Neapolitan. Delicious. Baked in a clay oven. Um, it's a specific type of uh, dough that they use. Delicious. But... It spreads and becomes other things. Just like I was talking about with Texas barbecue. You got Texas barbecue, Louisiana barbecue. You got, you know, you got the different barbecue sauce. You got the mustard sauce. You got the, you know, tomato-based sauces. We share our cultures through this idea of culinary representation. And we accept that. And we, we, we protect that in some ways. And I wonder what the passion is behind that. There are people who are so truly passionate about the culinary industry that they are willing to suffer. I'm here to tell you, having worked quite a few years in the service communities, at country clubs, in pizza shops, at bars, in restaurants, in multiple different faceted areas, you know, from, from dishwasher to line cook to, you know, fry station to tossing pies to, you know, 
banquet organization to pantry to you you, you name it. I, I've pretty much almost done all of it. No, I'm not great at it, but what I can tell you, having had that experience, these people fucking suffer. The wages suck. The hours suck. Sometimes the people suck. The drive to drink alcohol is ever present. There's always an alcoholic somewhere in the building willing to go out and take you out for drinks. Smoking cigarettes, nicotine gets you through. Maybe it's another drug of choice. There's rampant drug use. It's constant. Every day is 90 degrees or more. There's no such thing as a cool kitchen. It's all hot in some way or another. There's injuries constantly, burns, scrapes, cuts. There's constant changes to preparation styles. There's more, there's always something new you have to learn. It's never ending. A new preparation can come out tomorrow in a restaurant in New York that takes the world by buzz and then everybody does it. Or from Sweden, you know, um, Denmark, um, there's uh, five-star Michelin restaurants all over the world that set, you know, there's all these new chefs up and coming. There's always someone else who's willing to try to take your job. It's a stressful, shitty environment. But some people love it. They're so passionate about it. That's what they do their entire lives. And no, they don't become millionaires unless they open a restaurant. And that's only 1% of the uh, 1% of the service community population, maybe 5% total. But nobody's you know, only the ones that open up. And even then restaurants typically fail or don't do all that well. Massive overhead costs are outrageous. Staff alone is just a pain in the ass. You know, again, drug addicts and alcohol, not all of them, but like that's part of it. So you're hiring these people who are just unreliable. And then you have the two reliable people on staff that you have to, you know, put everything on and then hope they don't break because if they break, you're fucked. That's passion. These people are willing to suffer so that you can get a taste of different cultures, different heritages, different spiritualities. So I ask you, what's the difference between that which we covet in a society where wealth and status are important so you can go eat caviar and sushi and pa- 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 paella and marsala and um, tandoori and creme fraiche and tacos and ribs and burgers and fries and pizza and bolognese and ramen and Chinese America, you can eat your sesame chicken, you can, you know, uh, rice porridge, um, goulash. I'm trying to think of a Russian dish. That took me a second. Um, there's so many more I, I should name, but I, I, I'm it's not, not that great at it anymore. Um, you know, what is, what's the difference between that and sharing our culture. What is that difference? What is the change there? Like, what's the difference between coveting the idea that you can go out and get any cuisine you could possibly ever think of in New York City and being able to, within a 10-mile block or a 10-block radius, go to a mosque? go to a cathedral, go to a, a regular, ch- uh, not a regular church, but just like a, you know, a, a specific sect church to go to, um, you know, I don't even like, there's just so many options. Um, what is the difference of all that? What is the difference of on the same block having, you know, d- you know, to have all these different places of worship, like what, again, like what the spirituality centers there, you know, the synagogue or the temple or the mosque or the church or the cathedral or the, the home church, you know, cause that's a thing like the tarot card reader, the, the mystic medium, the, why don't we celebrate that? just like we celebrate the ability to try 
all of these different types of food. You know, that's the that's the spiritual representation there. That is the the heart of spirituality is that all of these things are spiritual. All of these things are a piece of a bigger system. Just like our heart is the cardiovascular epicenter keeping us alive, there's also other pieces. So what is the heart of spirituality? What, what really is it? I think if we looked at culinary, the culinary world and the possibilities there, we can come to better grips with, yeah, everybody gets to decide what their spirituality looks like. But, but, big but here, remember, buts usually mean forget about everything I just said before that. But, um, double but there. Uh, going back to the cards here, the emperor, the nine of cups, ten of coins. That's a question to me. Where does your spirituality come from? What is the heart? What's the epicenter of your spirituality? And if you don't know it, maybe then ask, like, what's the brain of your spirituality? What's the left hand? What's the right foot? What's the kneecap? What's the smell, taste? You know, use that reference of the physical body to to your spirituality because you have a spiritual body. What are the senses there? Where does your spirituality come from? What's the measurement of it? And what are you willing to suffer for? What are your passions? Because passions are a spiritual nature. They are answers to why questions. Why did someone do it? Because they were passionate about it. See how I put that together? That's why I say, what's the realm of why questions are spiritual questions. Because if you look at something like passion, it's a spiritual action. To be willing to suffer from something means you believe in it spiritually. There's no tangible measurement. There's no materialism to it. That's an answer to a why question. So if you look at someone's passions, you start to understand their spiritual natures. And then we can start to look deeper into each other and ourselves more importantly. Go through the definition. I'm just going to, we'll just use the base definition here, which I've said over and over again. Passion is the willingness to suffer for something. It is to suffer. What are you willing to suffer for? Freedom. The ability to eat all sorts of different foods. To gain a modicum of wealth to have a stable home. One of the things I've said before, and I'll continue to say is this statement. And I think it, 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 it fits very well here in this setting. You don't always get what you want, but you will get what you need. So to add that on top of this, you need to be passionate about what you need. If you need a new car, you'll put in the effort to get, you'll take on three jobs, work your ass off. You got to have the path. You got to have the willingness to suffer. And with that comes the story of Mahatma Gandhi. Comes the story of the ability to change oneself to get there. And also, you know, the story of Rosa Parks. She was willing to suffer to see the change she wanted to see in the world. That's the Mahatma Gandhi, you know, answer there. It's similar. You know, some amazing people in in history follow the same principal actions. So with that, I I, I, I think I closed this episode. I think I closed this episode on the idea of what's the heart of your spirituality? And if you don't know what it is yet, that's fine. Just, you know, look at it. Figure out what your passions are. They'll, they'll help define that. And to find those, those heart pieces, to find that passion, look at your cultural references and, and you know, your morals and ethics and maybe your upbringing and what you believe in culturally and what you would, 
I think we need to stop saying like what we need to protect culturally and start asking what we need to share culturally. What, what heritage do we need to share? What culture do we need to share? We were doing that for a really long time. You know, we were sharing the, you know, quote unquote, the old, you know, the, the sayings of our grandparents. And then we were like, oh, it's sexist. And it's come on. Everything can't be bad. Yes. Sexism absolutely existed, continues to exist to this day. And it's fucking wrong. Don't get my words twisted on that. But everything can't be wrong just because one person got offended. We can't just keep drawing these lines of black and white. It doesn't exist. It's always gray. It's always gray. It is always fucking gray. That's called balance. That's yin yang. This is where the story of creation is not the beginning. Chaos. Infinite possibility must be the beginning. Because if it's not, then yes, that argument can't persist. The argument of something happened to it have imbalanced it. No, it didn't. The universe is always seeking balance. It does that asymmetrically. In order to make balance from something that was imbalanced, it will destroy it. So yes, we should destroy sexism. How we haven't yet is unfathomable. But just like that, how we keep fighting wars over cultural references and have these conversations of corporal appropriation, have these conversations of these divisional lines that people keep wanting to use doesn't make any sense. Because we don't believe that. We don't believe that. Here's why we don't believe it. Because if I took any one of any cultural heritage and I put them in a war in which people were shooting at them and the only people they had to rely on were another four other individuals making up what's known as a sock group or a, or a small, you know, group, not a platoon, I think is the word I'm looking for. Um, although I think that's bigger, but I can't remember. Anyway, it doesn't matter. If I put them together with four other people of completely different cultural heritage, skin colors, backgrounds, stories, and their survival relied on them cohesively working together as a unit, you best fucking believe they're going to do it and they're going to let all that shit go away. Because in their heart, in their epicenter, in their spiritual belief, they want to survive they also want the person next to them to survive too. Maybe even if it's just out of necessity that that person needs to survive so I can survive. Fine. Let selfishness be a part of it. That's real. We've seen that time and time again. And I'm here to tell you, you're in a war. A war for your mental state, a war for everything about you. You grew up you were raised in and you continue to be in a, a state of warfare. You're in war. So what are you going to do about it? You're going to keep telling the person next to you to fuck off because society tells you that it's not okay to have anything in common with them. Or are you going to tell society and the higher ups to fuck off because you don't wish bad about them in any way. There's no reason to. Yeah, you can be introverted and just not want to like be a part of them, but like you don't hate them. What possible reason could you have to hate them? Because they have a different God than you? Or a different understanding of God than you? Different understanding. Like, come on, people. Like I'm I, maybe I've gone too far. I don't know. What's your three of swords? What's the truth there? And are you ignoring it? To like something, to like a flower is to pick a flower. To love a flower is to water it and, and, and see it grow. I just, I don't see how we can keep growing division and in, expect to get a flower and not get a weed or a, or a vine that chokes the life out of everything. The definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting different results. We have entered and have been in an age of insanity for a very long time. And we have to wake up and realize that we didn't, we ended up here. We didn't 
make the decision to get us here. Some very evil, willfully ignorant people did who wanted you to suffer so that they didn't have to. I think that's where I'll leave it. There's no happy ending on this one. There's no grand ending. I've just been rambling because there's no close to this. There's no close to passion. It's suffering. You have to suffer. I appreciate that you've suffered through this very long episode uh, or any episode that you've listened to me ramble on through. I, I appreciate that very much. Um, my passions or what people say I'm passionate about have to do with suffering. I'm passionate about my practice of body work. Not so much doing the body work. I'm passionate about serving the community. As introverted as I am, as much as I would love to just stay at home and never have to leave my house most of the time or just be left alone all the time, as socially awkward as I can be, but also socially do dominant as I can be in a professional sense. My passion is that I serve the community. I'm willing to suffer so that I am used to the, to the community around me because they deserve it. They, they haven't harmed me or done me wrong in any way. They, the farmers provide crops and, and animals so that I can eat amazing meals. The, the kitchen staff, you know, provides amazing things that I can order and eat that I don't have to prepare to save, save me time. And there's an exchange of monetary idea there. And there's an exchange of time, you know, the, the trainers at the gym are, are willing to give up their time so that they can show me how to work out and then to suffer through doing that workout with me. Cause I don't know how to fucking do it. Right. Um, the, the, the bartenders willing to suffer through my stupid fucking stories to serve me a drink. And not that I do that much anymore anyway, but like you get my point. I hope like that necessity of being of service to the community. That's what I'm passionate about. Fuck the politicians. Fuck the government's bullshit, the games they play. We don't need them. We don't need them. That's the, that's the truth. We don't need them. And I'm not saying get in the streets and riot and burn down the building. No. Be self-reliant in your community. Grow a garden. You know, teach others to grow a garden. Teach others things. Show your grandkids how to cook, how to whittle wood, how to do laundry, how to, you know, show your children. If you, if you don't have those things, share your expertises with others. No, you don't have to donate your time. No, you don't have to do charitable acts. That's not what I'm saying. You can get paid for these things. That's fine. But don't just hide them or squander them or, or you know, you say like, oh, you can't learn about my culture because, because it's my culture. Well, then that culture is going to die with you. Maybe that's what you want. Then yeah, do that. If that's what you want, that makes you happy or whatever. That's, that's what I'm talking about when it comes to passion. My passion is to suffer for the community because here's, and I, I can't believe I'm getting to this almost two hours into this whole conversation. Here's the truth behind suffering. It's not a bad thing. It's not a bad thing at all to suffer. Suffering builds things. It makes things. It creates possibility. And thus it's an agent of chaos. And that's why it's gotten that chaos is part of the way why chaos gets that negative connotation. Because yes, there's suffering that goes along with it. But some of the most beautiful things in the world come from suffering. Think about food. Think about that delicious barbecue you had that someone had to get up at 3 a.m. to stoke the flames, to sit and, you know, they gave up sleep. They suffered sleepless nights to, you know, keep the fire going. That the farmer had to get up at 3 a.m. to go feed the animals or get their day started. You know, some of the most beautiful things come from suffering. Think about the ingeniousness of some of the artists in the world, be it musical or physical or, or interpretive dance or, you know, 
Think about the suffering of the professional athletes and the things they go through. Think about the sufferings of these things, of these people we call celebrities. You think it's easy to go be on a movie set for 16 hours out of the time, day? Yeah, some of them are, you know, are kind of dramatic about all of it, but hey, you know what? They suffered too. Or, you know, just the suffering of the kitchen staff getting paid shitty or any service community, the, the person bagging the groceries and, you know, don't get to go hang out with the, everyone's supposed to be suffering because beautiful, amazing things come from suffering. So go do some suffering. Be passionate. Check us out at taminghindrances.com. My call to actions, I have to remember. Check out purebulk.com. Um, use, taming, uh, use Taming Hindrances coupon code for 10% off. Uh, check out um, the Mystical Manga Guidebook uh, by Ron, R-A-N-N, and text by Barbara Moore. Uh, I believe you can get that on Amazon. Again, link will be on uh, the archive over at Taming Hindrances. And, uh, yeah, just go be passionate. Go suffer. Go put some effort in. Great things can come of it. Take care. Thanks for listening. Come check us out at TamingHindrances.com for show notes, links, resources, and more. 